You're listening to the Meaningful Content Mixer. I'm Bonnie, a content professional focused on pre-sales and product marketing. And I'm Sarah, a content professional focused on post-sale knowledge management. Together, we like to explore what it takes to create meaningful content that is purposeful, demand-driven, and contextually relevant. We are sharing strategies, tactics, and stories that help content professionals across disciplines create more meaningful content that drives successful outcomes for their customers. Let's get started. Hi, Bonnie. Hey, welcome back. Yeah, great to see you. So before we get started, have you read or learned anything recently that's, you know, since we last talked? Yes, I did. So one of my... I'm a book hoarder. So anytime I buy books, I just keep them forever. And I was just out of curiosity wanting to look at uh, some of the books that I have from back in the day when I studied uh, uh, tech com and writing. Mm -hmm. There's this book called Information Anxiety 2, which I ended up... um, Yeah, so I bought it back in the day. This book was published in 2001. And I wanted to see if I could find anything from, you know, back then that would be relevant today, or I was trying to see if there was anything that was so different from how things are now. Yeah. What I ended up finding was this really, really relevant page. As soon as I opened it up, I just went right to this page. And so I wanted to, uh, I brought this today to share with you so that I could read it and then you could see how relevant it is. Okay. A little show and tell. I like it. Yeah. So it says too many companies are trying. Oh wait, let me start over. So, um, the, the first sentence I wanted to read is exchanging information is a form of transaction. Mm -hmm. Too many companies are trying to separate these transactions into different areas. I believe the most successful will be the ones that look at the commonalities among all transactions. And this was really in regards to um, um, information in the digital age. And so this book talks a lot about, you know, going from brick and mortar to click and mortar and how important it is to continue to provide those, um, those great experiences, um, even if it's not face-to-face in a store. But I thought this was so relevant because, you know, one of the things that we're talking about is how knowledge or how information and content isn't, shouldn't be siloed. The conversations shouldn't be siloed. And, and I thought it was interesting that this, this book kind of was talking about that back in 2001, really talking about digital transformation, how important it is to create those, um, those experiences online and, You know, it's still something that people are still figuring out today, which I thought was, was kind of funny. It's been several years and yet it's still, it's still very relevant today. Yeah. I love that. It makes me think about something we talk about often, which is that the product and the content experience are really merging and becoming one in the same rather than sort of separate, um, you know, separate swim lanes. And so it's interesting that back in 2001, you said that was published. I think it was first published in 2000. Yeah. So they were talking about it from the perspective of the transition from physical stores to digital stores and that it served them well. It served brands well to think about those as part of the same consumer experience. And I think we're almost learning that lesson again yeah. with products that have been born in the digital age and then content that's kind of was created to support it. And now we have to really think about those things as being one in the same and that's going to serve our business and our customers better. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think it is relevant to what we're going to talk about today, which is this Nike commercial that has, you know, made a very big splash right right when it was um, published. And before we talk about this Nike commercial, though, it really reminded me of some research that Google published last year that I've obsessively referred back to many times <laughs> since they published it. It's from their kind of marketing research um, focus called Think with Google. I've been a subscriber to it for a long time. And this particular article was called How Consumer Needs Shape Search Behavior and Drive Intent. And intent specifically is a thing that 
I know that um, in my career, we focused on a bunch and it's a content marketing focus that's gained uh, significance in recent years because it really can inform content marketing strategy at its essence intent is understanding why a customer or a consumer might be looking for something, understanding what's the intent behind their journey when they might come across your brand. And this research by Google was actually trying to uncover the underlying needs that drive intent. And one of my favorite quotes from this article specifically says, after all, you don't wake up feeling intent. <laughs> and I really liked that because I think sometimes we can kind of go a little too scientific with how we think about things in content mm -hmm. marketing and or content strategy in general. And we have to remember that we're marketing towards humans and we're quite complex and dynamic and emotionally driven. So Google partnered with Kantar, which is a consumer insights company, and they partnered to do this research. And they uncovered six needs that they think drive intent. So the, the why behind the why really. And so those six things are surprise me, help me, reassure me, educate me, impress me, and thrill me. And so we kind of have a range of things there between you know, you can kind of see them as some of them are entertainment driven and some of them are more, um, you know, looking for help or information, but they have quite a spectrum there. And that each of those needs is a combination, this is how complex things are, it's a combination of emotional, social, social and functional needs. And that emotions are really the foundation of what we need. And that as much as I, I thought this was a really interesting insight because I like to think of myself as a logical person, but this article says, well, none of us really are as logical <laughs> as we think because they still, so I'll say this other quote, they say that the truth is decision-making is not a rational process, but one driven mainly by how people feel and the rational brain layers on reasons for our choices only after they've been made. So now I'm going to question all of my decisions forever. <laughs> if none of them are logical because they're all emotional, even if we're so confident that there's a logical reason, there's actually a lot of emotion behind, you know, everything we do as consumers. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Um, and when you're talking about intent, that, that reminds me of how we are as content creators and making sure that we're considering intent when we're creating content. So for example, there are a lot of fields where, you know, when you're creating content, you're really focusing on one intent, like help me instead of, you know, delight me, for example. So, um, so yeah, I think it's, it's great to consider the different intents. So even if you are creating content that meets one specific intent, maybe take a step back and see if, if that's really true. And if there are other intents that you are, are you know, meeting. Yeah, and this research uncovered that it's almost always a combination of these need states. It's n almost never as simple as just one, even if we kind of say that after the fact. So uh, thinking about all those layers of emotions and needs behind yeah. events, yeah, in any part of the journey. It's more complicated. <laughs> it's part of the fun and part of the challenge, I think. Exactly. Yeah. And the, the emotional side I think is, is extremely relevant, especially when we're talking about the Nike ad, because it really relied on a lot of emotion in, in that advertising to, to get the point across. Yes, I totally agree. It was very emotional, kind of tapped into, um, you know, it, 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 it was something that to me seemed very personal and community driven at the same mm -hmm. time. Uh, and I think they did that really well. Uh, a couple interesting stats about how powerful this, this commercial was. Yeah, let's get into it. Yeah. So within a couple days of this video of this commercial, it is a commercial, we should remember, <laughs> uh, that it was launched, it was viewed 20 million times on Twitter and more than 11 million times on YouTube. So that was just within a couple of days. It's been, mm -hmm. been longer than that now. That's how much it was viewed. And uh, Forbes reported that the folks behind the commercial combed through 4,000 hours of footage to turn it into that 90 second commercial. And what they ended up with was 72 clips that were combined in 36 split screen pairs. So throughout the commercial, you see sort of 36 pairs of 
um, footage or, you know, sport <laughs> yeah. experience happening. It's amazing how much time and effort and work went into putting together something that lasted 90 seconds, mm -hmm. but they obviously did something right. They did it well because it was, you know, it went viral. It's hugely successful. Um, and it went viral for a number of reasons, but I think for, for, for our purposes, we want to really look at the content and see what made the content work so well and see what we can maybe leverage from that and use in our own work. Yeah, I agree. I'd love to talk about it and see, you know, I'm not, I'm not in advertising, of course, but what can we pull out of this successful content that they did so well and think about how we can apply it? Yeah. Other types. Yep. So I want to start by, let me just pull up the script and just read that and then we can, we can dig in. Okay, great. Okay. So this is the script that was for the Nike commercial. It was read by Megan Rapinoe, I believe. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is it so it goes like this. We're never alone. And that is our strength because when we're doubted, we'll play as one. When we're held back, we'll go farther and harder. If we're not taken seriously, we'll prove that wrong. And if we don't fit the sport, we'll change the sport. We know things won't always go our way, but whatever it is, we'll find a way. And when things aren't fair, we'll come together for change. And no matter how bad it gets, we'll always come back stronger because nothing can stop what we can do together. And I love this because it's, it's a Nike ad, but nothing in the script, nothing in that story talks about Nike or says Nike or says shoes or anything like that. That's a really good point. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so when it comes to this ad, one of the first things that I recognized and, and found with it was this whole narrative approach that they have. Um, so Nike is really known for their narrative approach, um, which is really telling a story about the product consumption and the experience of using the product and how it impacts you as a user rather than talking about themselves. And so a narrative approach or this, the storytelling approach is, um, is one way of doing advertising. I've been hearing about it a lot lately, actually. And so seeing this Nike commercial brought it to light is a perfect example about, you know, telling a story with a commercial instead of just talking about, you know, what this product does and, and how effective it is. Yeah, I love that. I think so much in advertising that I've learned to try to be aware of as a conscious consumer is how often advertising is trying to make you feel like you have a need that isn't fulfilled yet and their product is there too. Yeah. So that problem that you didn't even know you had, um, like magic. And so this to me seems like quite a departure from that strategy. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they don't seem to really be trying to sell us anything. Although of course, you know, with the, with the brand recognition and instead it's more about almost reminding us about what matters. I'm mm -hmm. sure there's a strategy behind this, behind this of, um, you know, of, of us feeling motivated to do athletic oriented things <laughs> or hopefully with their products, but that, that there's so much power and community and connection in even individual activities that we can feel connected to others, especially in this time of social distancing that, you know, partaking in these like, types of activities and the feelings behind it, the power behind it uh, can be really significant. Yeah. And, and I think in addition to it being a narrative approach, there are a few other, other key things that I found that would be maybe interesting to tap into. So in addition to the storytelling side of it, it is using emotional branding, like you, like you mentioned, to appeal to our motivations and, and aspirations and needs. And emotional branding can also be really effective, especially when you're tapping into something that you know your, your users and your customers are actually feeling or you know what motivates them, then that can be a really successful way to, um, to leverage in advertising. Yeah, I like that. And I think tapping into the layered emotions of, I think I mentioned this a bit already, of the individual versus the, the relevant group. And so yeah. if you think about even from a business perspective, when you're advertising a product or service at someone, 
there's always multiple layers there. There's how can this help you as an individual be better at your job, but also how can you then create results for your company or for your customer mm-hmm. base and this kind of dichotomy between the individual and the group and that they're both relevant. Yeah. And it's almost this feeling of, you know, you're not alone. We're in it together, mm-hmm. we'll pull through it together, which also, you know, as part of the emotional play here, they tapped into timely and relevant world events. So, you know, tapping into COVID and with sports being put on hold and canceled, you know, we're still finding a way to make it work or do something, right? We're, we're making it work for us, even if we're facing these confusing and uncertain times. Yeah, great point. And, and with that, there's a lot of disagreement about the right way, the, the safe way to reintroduce these things that have been part of our lives for so long. And so this commercial is a nice reminder that as much as folks might disagree about certain details, that at the core, we're all connected and we're all the same. We all really want the same thing. It's just mm-hmm. maybe we disagree on the best way to get there. And it's, yeah. it's important to remind folks of that commonality. Right, right. And I think that probably the biggest piece to this ad that really stood out to me is their focus on people. So they're focused on the outcome. They're focused on the people. They are, um, you know, the, the imagery that they use are the players going through a range of emotions from uh, successful wins to losses to, you know, falling down and not winning to being so close and not getting there. So it's all of these emotions that it plays into and you can see it in the, see it in their, their advertising through the, the human imagery that they're using. So they're really tapping into that people side of things. Yeah. I, agree. I think that's very intentional because when you look back at their strategy over their years with advertising, it really has been this, this narrative approach focused on the people and the outcomes and I actually, when I was digging into the ad and, and looking into a little bit behind the scenes, I found this old interview by Phil Knight, who is the uh, co-founder and former CEO of Nike. And it was the Harvard Business Review, I believe, who was doing this interview. But he, he made a statement where he said, and I'll, I'll read the quote here, um, we used to think everything started in a lab. Now we realize that everything spins off the consumer. And while technology is still important, the consumer has to lead to innovation. So early on, you know, when Nike was first becoming successful, they tapped into that consumer first approach and have put that into everything, including their advertising and just leading with that human, uh, human emotion, human stories and what they really want and need. And I think that's really interesting because that, that was, how they became so successful. And a lot of companies, I think, still struggle with finding that balance between, you know, finding the value for our customers and then the customers being the value. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. And I hadn't thought about how consumer brands like this might've been, you know, years or decades ahead of software companies <laughs> my experience when it comes to really prioritizing that consumer experience. Um, I think I'm constantly trying to find ways to highlight the real human's experience mm-hmm. in my work. And it's hard to do because when you yeah. work in software, especially your whole day, you know, the life cycles of the product, it revolves around this thing that is not human. Yeah. <laughs> uh, creating tools and services for humans to use. And so I think we have to be creative and really diligent about constantly bringing the, the human experience into our mm-hmm. content. So thinking about what else you want to talk about. Mm. So if I were to think about other takeaways from this Nike commercial, which in many ways feels almost as, you know, different in terms of an outcome or deliverable than the content I generally work on in my day to day. Mm. I think based on some of the themes you highlighted here, there's a lot that we can take away from it. And the first or most important one, of course, is just remembering the humans and that these 
products and services and our jobs, they don't exist without the people who are using them and that we do really need to constantly think about their experience, what their emotions, their intent, what, what matters to them right now. Yeah. And how are we, how are we highlighting that in our content strategy? How are we prioritizing that in mm-hmm. our content strategy? Yeah. And like you said, I mean, the outcome was great, but it was great because they really understood their customer. They really understood their users. Their customers are wanting to be playing sports or wanting to go watch sports, wanting to be outside and doing these things. And they incorporated all of that sentiment into their ad. And so that's just a a, a great example of understanding your user and, and putting something out that really resonates with them. Yeah. And the, and the scope of what matters to them goes so far beyond just the, the interaction, the part of the interaction that you control. And um, one of the things you pointed out that they don't actually, this commercial doesn't directly sell anything that Nike creates. Yeah. And we should think about that too, when we're creating content that meant to, that is meant to help our customers how can we help them accomplish what they need, even if it has almost nothing to do with our product or service? I mean, it should be enough so that it, there's some relevance there that why yeah. we might have the, you know, the resource that they're looking to, but thinking about how we can really enhance or add value to what their bigger picture task or need is that goes much beyond our specific product or service. Yeah. But yeah, I thought it was uh, an interesting ad. I know it moved me when I watched it, um, just seeing the struggles and the successes. I don't know if it was the script or the music or the visuals or everything combined, it but it was. I was really impressed. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, as content professionals, at a minimum, I think we're, we're fans of this yeah. content. <laughs> and I think it is a great example of of something that we can look to that's maybe outside of our typical domain to get inspiration and and bring that that success of their work into our work. Yeah. So I think that that was a great example of, of one of the things that we can learn from. Looking forward to seeing what else we can uncover and share in future episodes. Yes, this was fun. Thanks, Bonnie. All right. Thanks. Till next time. Yeah.